I'm so thrilled that you decided to join us here today at New Life Church. New Life is simply one church in multiple locations, as well as you can join from anywhere in the world through New Life Online. Whether you joined us last week for the first week in our Hope series, or this is your first time, we have incredible things coming up for you. And we, I want you to have the best experience possible. And so here's what you can expect from New Life Church here online today. First is there's people who are joining in the chat. They would love to connect with you, help you feel welcomed because guess what? You're a real person and there's other real people who are joining online who would love to connect with you right now. We have also a, a sermon series that we're in today called Hope. It's the power of everything and Pastor Jeff has an incredible message that is going to help you to fuel your hope in your personal life. But before we dive into that, we are gonna start by worshiping God through singing a song. We're simply connecting with God and turning our heart and our attention towards Him so that He can be the one that is fueling us in our lives. So I just invite you to worship with us now here at New Life Church. Good morning, New Life. We are so glad to have you joining us today. It is a great day to worship the Lord. We also want to welcome our friends online and in Ogallala. So with that, why don't you join us in worship? Oh, yeah. 
What a great time of worshiping together. Worship is one of my favorite things to do at church, to connect with God through singing the song. I'm so thrilled that you decided to join today. If you're just logging on, we're just getting things started. Still got great things coming up. My name's Robert. I'm your online pastor. We've got a message from Pastor Jeff coming up in a little bit, as well as responding to what God speaks to us through that. But I just wanted to let you know first, if you're new to New Life, I'm so glad that you're here today. I wanted to say welcome, and it's my personal passion to help you get connected and uh, help you in any other way that I can today. I don't know what brought you to church today, whether you're looking for a church to get connected to, maybe you are going through a difficult season in your life, or maybe you are looking to explore what this Jesus thing is all about. Whatever brought you today, I'm so glad you're here. And I just love if you let me know that you're new today so that I can send you an email welcoming you and give you a free digital gift card just as a way of saying welcome. You can let me know you're new today by clicking the Get Connected link in the chat, or you can go and text the word online to the number on your screen. And just put New Life Online as your campus. That way it sends me a notification and I can send you an email with your free digital gift card as well as see if there's any other way that I can help you out today. I also got to let you know that there are other real people who are joining online with you today. That's right. You're a real person. There's other real people joining and they're in the chat right now. They'd love to connect with you. So hop in there. Let us know where in the world you're joining from. But if you're part of New Life, I got to let you know that there's an opportunity for you to serve here online. You can serve from anywhere in the world through New Life Online uh, by being an online chat host who is connecting in the chat, welcoming people, um, praying with people, really just being someone who is helping others to get connected here online. So if you're interested at all in that, I need four more people to become online chat hosts. And I'd love for you to be one of those people. So just let me know if you're interested by going to mynewlifechurch.com slash online, filling out that I'm interested in serving form. That way I can reach out to you and answer any of your questions and help you start uh, taking next steps towards serving online as a chat host today. Also, something really big happened this week. We were able to fund our Kingdom Builder partner in El Salvador. If you're new to New Life and you don't know about Kingdom Builders, Kingdom Builders is simply how we give generously to Kingdom Builder partners and organizations to meet practical needs as well as share the hope of Jesus with others. So I'd love to share with you now this Kingdom Builder update video from our missionary partner in El Salvador. Hi, I'm Kenton Moody, and my wife Eunice and I work here in Santana, El Salvador, and we're one of the Kingdom Builder missionaries that you're helping around the world. We're so grateful for what you do to help us yearly, for your commitment to, to Christ, your commitment to the world. What we're doing here is we're building a home for a needy family. They're living in, in really rough conditions in a tin shack with a dirt floor. So we have a team here this week that's helping build two homes. Uh, this is going to be like eight homes in the last two months that we've been able to put up. And it's your giving and your praying that really uh, helps us do this. Uh, we'll be also building homes for our students in the school. We've been in the school this week. We've been evangelizing. We've had the spiritual emphasis. It's been a really full week, but God has blessed, and we've had numerous salvation, people that have come to know Jesus Christ, and that's what you're doing. You're not just making a difference physically, but you're making a difference spiritually, and we're so blessed to be your missionaries and, and to be your hand extended to those that are in need here in El Salvador. We want to encourage you this year, as you think about kingdom builders, as you think about what God would have you do, what can I do for Jesus this year? What can he do through me? And we know God is going to continue to use you around the world. We love you. We appreciate you. And we say, God bless you if I care, here from El Salvador. That is so incredible. I hope you're filled with joy knowing that you were able to help make that happen, being able to build a home for someone in El Salvador who's in need. And we're actually taking a global outreach trip to El Salvador with other people who, New Life Church people are actually gonna be going and building some of those homes as well as doing other things with our Kingdom Builder partner. So I just thank you for your generosity and giving. And I wanna give you an opportunity if you're ready today to give online as well. You can give of your Kingdom Builders giving as well as your tithe online today. And the tithe is just the first 10% of your income, giving back to God what he's already given to you. It's a worshipful response to God. And so I just want to let you know that your tithe is going to meet 
uh, practical needs in the communities where we have campuses at New Life. And it's helping to reach out and share the hope with others. So I just thank you for your generosity. If you're new to New Life, there's no pressure at all to give. But if you are a part of New Life, now is your opportunity to give. And I just thank you for being such a generous church. Now we're getting ready to go into our message today from Pastor Jeff in our series, Hope the power of everything. And Pastor Jeff has really practical things for you today. He's going to talk about four things that kill hope in your life and four things that you can start developing in your life that will fuel hope. So I hope that you are inspired and that you're encouraged from today's message. Invite someone to join you online right now. Just copy and paste the link and send it to them. Now let's go to Pastor Jeff for today's teaching. Oh, man. Wow, it's been a wild ride since Easter, everybody. Everybody, man, it's been a wild ride. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I joked at Easter that uh, one of my best Easter's as a kid was when I discovered the Cadbury cream egg and then those Cadbury, like, small chocolates with the crispy stuff. And then one of the families here at the church bought me that. And I also joked about how fun it would be to take a straw and jam it into one of those Cadbury cream eggs and suck out all the cream. And then to give your sister, like if you're a little kid, give your sister the, the hollow egg, wrap it back up. And somebody literally put on my desk a bag with a Cadbury egg, cream egg and a straw. I just want to say thank you for being a congregation that listens to the details of the sermons. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That, uh, that's love. That is love right there. And I mean it. I'm just joking around. But I, I actually got that. I tried it. I almost lost a lung. You can't suck out. You can't suck that stuff out. I tried it. It's done. It's over. Don't even try it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. But uh, last week, man, Pastor Tyler from North Platte, did he come and bring a great word or what? Come on, North Platte, I'm telling you right now, you got a great campus pastor. You got a great campus pastor. And New Life Church is a better church because of pastors like Tyler and Sarah and the rest of our staff, by the way. But I loved that message, man. I watched it this past week and I was inspired. I just want to make sure everybody knows uh, that's watching us online, that is not a real brick wall. Just letting you know, all right? Because when I was watching online, I was like, who built the brick wall? And I was like, oh, it's an LED screen. My bad, my bad. Uh, we're gonna continue the series today on hope. It, the, the, the real title of, the, of this series is called Hope, the Power of Everything. The Power of Everything. And that's really what hope is. Hope is the power or it's the fuel that makes your life go. It makes your life achieve greater things. It gives you purpose. It gives you drive. It gives you vision. Hope is where dreams come from, right? Hope is where incredible game plans come from. Hope is what gets you up when you fall down. Hope is the power of everything. And I want to talk to you a little bit more about that. But first, you guys know that I like to fly, okay? And um, so I was recently reading a story about a guy by the name of Gary Powers, if you guys don't know Gary Powers, Gary Powers uh, used to fly the U-2 spy plane. This spy plane is incredible. If you've ever seen it, if you've ever been close to one, they're, they're really quite interesting. Um, they got about 103 foot uh, wingspan on them. They fly at the unclassified height at the time was 80,000 feet, which means that they flew higher because how many people know the government's always got to keep something from you or things or many things from you. Um, so it flew at that. You had to wear an astronaut suit to actually fly in the plane. The plane has only a front wheel and a back wheel, okay? And so when it takes off, it's got these little sticks with these wheels on it that balance the wings. And when it takes off, the little sticks fall away. And then when it lands, these chaser trucks have to come up next to it, and they have to grab the wings as the plane lands. It's, a, it's a fascinating, fascinating plane. It's probably the reason why we don't have it in service any longer. <coughs> But on May 1st, 1960, Gary Powers took off out of Pakistan on a spy mission over the Soviet Union. Now at the time, uh, according to our intelligence, we didn't know that the Soviets had developed a missile that could actually go the height of a U-2 spy plane. We thought we could fly over any country that we wanted to, and we were going to just be able to take whatever pictures we wanted to take whenever we wanted to. We had dominance at 80,000 plus feet. Well, we didn't realize it, but the Soviets had created a missile that could take down a U-2 spy plane. Evidently, they didn't like us flying over their country. 
So they shot Gary Powers down on May 1st, 1960. And he crashed, he crashed, he, he comes down in his parachute, they capture him, right? They, they, they try him for espionage, for spying, of which he was guilty, all right? And then they threw him, they threw him in a Russian prison. And for two years, that's where he lived. He lived there until we traded him for another, another, uh, another prisoner, and we got him back. Gary Powers comes back to the United States, and he's like a war hero, right? I mean, he is like a, he's a hero. And so he, he goes on to do other things because he loves to fly. And so he gets back in the cockpit, and he starts becoming a, a pilot for experimental aircraft. Now, listen to this. An aircraft that's experimental means that on paper, it should fly. Some guinea pigs got to get in the cockpit and take off, right? And that's Gary Powers. So it's a very dangerous job. He survives all of that, okay? And then he ends up later in his life becoming a helicopter pilot in Los Angeles for a news station. It's a cush job for a guy who once used to flew in an astronaut suit at 80,000 plus feet. But while flying one of those cush missions of the traffic report in L.A., which I could tell you the traffic report in L.A. without a helicopter. (laughs) It's backed up. And it's going to take you time to get where you want to go today. Right? But he was in a helicopter, and he crashed, and he died. Yeah, it's a sad story to a guy who once used to fly a spy plane at over 80,000 feet. But why did he crash the helicopter in Los Angeles? And here's the reason why. He actually ran out of gas. It's a true story. Here's this great pilot. He runs out of gas. Here's what I'm trying to drive home for you today concerning hope. It doesn't matter what kind of experience you have, and it doesn't matter how good people actually think that you are, if you run out of hope, you're going to crash. If you run out of hope, you're going to crash. Now look, I I am a pilot, and I have learned to fly, and I do fly on a regular basis. And I'm going to tell you right now, when I went through that training, when you go through the training to be a pilot, there's, there's one basic thought they're trying to drive into you. There's a lot of things that can kill you, and we're going to try to teach you how to survive. I know, it sounds very, very exhilarating and very hopeful. But they're like, look, there's a lot of things that can kill you. And then one of those things is this, the engine stops running while you're in flight. That can kill you, it doesn't have to kill you. But they'll, they'll test that on you. Back in the day, they used to do that. Now, they've come up with new regulations, and they determined it's probably unsafe to turn the engine off when we're at flight. So we'll just pull the power now. But back when I started, no, 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 no. Now, you're just cruising along, and you think you're in control, and then all of a sudden, your instructor reaches over and goes, click, and it all goes dead. And when that happens, you would think anxiety soars on the inside of you. But instead, something else happens. Here's what happens. All of a sudden, things get really, really quiet. There's no sound of any engine. It's just the sound of wind over the fuselage, right? And then it's you. You hear nothing, and then you. Ah! That's the first time. After that, the instructor pulls his headphones off and goes, my ears are now bleeding. Um, let me tell you what to do. And so you, you learn you learn very quickly. The, the plane doesn't instantly, when you pull the engine, doesn't instantly nosedive and crash. No, the, the plane actually continues to float along. It will slowly lose altitude, and eventually, if you don't land it, it's going to crash into the ground. So without the engine's power, the airplane will eventually lose altitude, and it will crash. And without hope, you will eventually lose joy. You will lose peace. You will lose purpose. You will lose faith. Okay, because without hope, you will eventually lose altitude in your life. You will eventually crash. But God wants just the opposite for you. God wants you to be full of hope. Would you turn to three people really quick and just look them in the eye and tell them, God wants you to be full of hope. Would you just tell them that really quick? Come on. God wants you to be full of hope. Now say it like you mean it, people. Say it like you mean it, right? All right, all right. God wants you to be full of hope. Now, Pastor Tyler last week, I thought he he brought up a great passage of Scripture. I want to bring you back to it. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Okay, and I want you to read this with me at all campuses, online as well. Okay, read this with me, Romans 15, 13. Okay, out loud. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because 
you trust in him, then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now look, let's just stop for a moment. Let's break this down. Let's break it down. Okay, Pastor Tyler did a good job last week of helping you see a few things in this. It says, I, I pray, I pray that God, and who is God? God is the what? It's the source of hope. The scripture's still up there. Okay, who is God? God is the source of hope. Why did I say hope? Hope is the power of everything? How can I confidently say hope is the power of everything? Because the Bible tells me that God is the source of hope. And if God is the source of hope, hope is the power of everything. And that here's what God wants to do. He will fill, he will, he, he will fill you completely okay, with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will what with hope? You will overflow. Did you realize that God wants to fill you with hope, not just for you, but for your family and for your children and for your workplace and for your neighbor? He wants you to overflow with hope. Why? Because this world is a world that depletes hope. And we are carriers of the source of life called Jesus Christ. And in us is the authority of the Holy Spirit. And in your life, you are to overflow with hope. Not just have enough to get by. Not just have enough for today. But to overflow with hope. So God is the source of hope. And God wants you to overflow with hope. How? Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can't do it on your own. And he goes, look, I will give you the Holy Spirit to overflow with hope. It's what I want to do for your life. But he asks you in that scripture to do something. He asks you to trust him. Because you trust in me, I will cause you to overflow with a confident hope through the Holy Spirit. So church, what should we be doing through this series? We should be leaning into God. We should be opening up our heart to him and say, God, I don't have what it takes to increase hope in my life. No human being in and of themselves can increase hope in their life. Not a single one of you. Not Jeff Baker either. There's nothing I can do in and of my own strength to increase hope. But where there is hope, then God's word says there is joy. And where there is hope, there is peace. Are you lacking joy in your life? Are you lacking peace in your life? Then run to the source, God. Open up your heart to him and say, Holy Spirit, fill me. Trust that God is the one who can lead you and guide you. He will fill you with a confident hope that will overflow. The evidence of your life when you follow Jesus Christ is a hope that overflows. The rest of the world goes, it's in chaos. It's going to hell in a handbasket. And you go, yeah, but there's hope. You're looking at your, your life and all of a sudden you lose your job and everything's turning against you. And, you. and everyone else goes, wow, you should turn and curse God like you're Job or something. And you go, nope, there's hope. Something about trusting God causes your life to overflow with hope. So watch this. If God wants you to be full of hope and to overflow with hope, then what do you think Satan wants? He doesn't want you to be hopeful at all. He doesn't, want you, he doesn't want you to have any hope for tomorrow. He, he wants you to think that today's bad and tomorrow's worse. If, if, I just thought I would speak back to Siri for a moment. <laughs> but it sounded like a different language, so I didn't know what to do with that. And if you're online, just know, we had mysterious voices in the auditorium. <laughs> I don't know what it's about. Security, security. But the point, that's the point, right? The point is that if God wants you to be full of hope, you'd know you've got an enemy who's trying to deplete your hope. So I want to tell you today, there's, I think there's four key things. There's a lot of things that Satan does to kill hope in your life, but I think there's four key things that he does. And, and the very first one is this. He uses unhealthy people. He brings purposefully unhealthy people into your life. Th these are people that have different morals than you, different dreams, they have different desires. They don't have a desire to honor God. They lack integrity. They lack character. Isn't it amazing that when you are on the increase and God's growing in your life, it's like all of a sudden this, these people come around you that want to pull you back down. I've watched it over and over and over and over again that when you're trying to become the man or the woman of God, if you're not trying to become the man or woman of God, you got nothing to worry about. 
But if you're really wanting to become the man or woman of God, it's amazing how God all of a sudden pulls people back into your life. You, you could be in your 50s trying to seek after God, try to become all God wants you to be, and all of a sudden an old college buddy calls you out of nowhere. Hey, I'm going to be in town. Why don't you meet me at the bar? And you flash back to those moments in college at the bar, and you're like, I'm not the same man anymore. But there's this temptation. You see what I'm saying? Like, it's amazing when you're trying to become those people. Proverbs chapter uh, 13, verse 20 says this. Walk with the wise and become what? All right. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Walk with the wise and hope increases. Walk with the fools and you get in trouble. Where do you get in trouble? Not only do you get in trouble maybe physically, but you get in trouble mentally. You get in trouble emotionally and you get in trouble spiritually. And when you're in trouble when you're in trouble emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, and physically, what happens to hope? It depletes in your life, right? So let me tell you, spoken as a former fool, I'll be the first to stand in front of you. Welcome to the church of fools. All we are is former fools. Every single one of us is. If you think that you're above that, then you need to get back to ground zero and recognize where you came from. Spoken as a former fool, I know what it was like to be the person that was the unhealthy person coming into your life and killing hope, because that's who I was. I know what it was like to tempt you to spend all of your money on things you didn't want to spend your money on. I knew what it was like to go out on a Friday night and to keep you out all night. I, I knew what it was like, because when I was living as a fool, I wasn't just a 99% fool, I was a 100% fool. But here's the good news about God. God knows how to take former fools and turn them into wise guys. Dude, that's what that scripture. Hang out with the wise and you become wise. Hang out with the fool and you get in trouble. How many of you guys are thankful that you were a former fool that God turned in to a, to a wise guy? Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. That's good news, right? That is good news, right? And so the good news is this. I don't care where you are in your life right now. God can take whoever you are Whatever's going on, you could be the most unhealthy person in the room, and God can take you, and he can turn you into the wise. Awesome. So what do you do if, you, if you're finding that the hope killer of unhealthy people is in your life? Here's what you got to do. you got to take a pause from those people. you got to walk away sometimes. you got to make other plans. Make other plans before they make plans for you. Because unhealthy people are, are incredible at making plans for you that will keep robbing you of hope. So we got to walk away from those, all right? Do you see what I'm saying? How, how the enemy uses unhealthy people to kill hope in our lives? Okay, good. Let's, ru let's run through these because i got four things that God does as well that are amazing. I want to get to those. The second thing is God uses unkind critics. These are the people that don't believe in your dream. These are the people that don't see the best in you. These are the people that nitpick you. Unfortunately, sometimes that could be your spouse. Some of the most unkind critics are some of the closest people to you. Isn't that true? The unkind critics are not normally the person that you don't know that just comes out of nowhere and just kind of says something to you because you can pretty much brush that off. The unkind critic is the person that's closest to you that says words that wound you. And right now, right now, I, I know it's painful, but would you think with me about words that have wounded you? And isn't it easy to come up with words that wound and associate them with the face of a person? Unfortunately, it's true. It comes from our childhood. It happens in our teen years. It, it takes place in early years of unhealthy marriage. And if you allow the unkind critic, to those words to continue to echo in your heart, it kills hope. It acts like acid to the soul. It erodes hope. I remember, I remember sharing a vision with a man when I lived in Alaska, North Pole, Alaska, of all places, just outside of Fairbanks. And I shared, this, uh, I shared the vision with him. I said to him, I go, look, man, I really feel like God has called me to be a pastor. He goes, oh, yeah? My son's a pastor. I go, I know. That's why I'm sharing the vision with you. I said, I feel like God's called me to be a youth pastor. And guys, can I just tell you that this man who had a son who is a pastor in Alaska he, he looked at me and he goes, it'll never work, Jeff. It'll never work. Let me tell you why it'll never work. You have too many kids and youth pastors don't get paid enough. Like, it will never work. You, you have to come up with another dream. And I remember this, these man's, this man's words, this, this unkind critic speaking these words to me. I had to make a decision that day. 
I loved this man. I've been to his house multiple times. He had treated my kids like he was a, uh, he was a distant grandfather, the grandfather that my kids didn't have because we were so many hours and days away from my own parents. Right? I mean, they were close to us, and those words, I could have let hurt me and wound me, but I chose not to. In fact, here's what I noticed about those words. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18 says that some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. That was a cutting remark, and you could let that cut and leave a wound, or you can let it cut and heal the wound. I chose to let it heal the wound. Why? Because I realized I wasn't marching to his orders. I was marching to the orders of another one. I was marching to the orders of the almighty God who had called me to do it. And if God called me to do it, God would provide. Amen? And and that's who God is. That's what God does. But guys, we live in a world that's got a critical spirit to it. All around us, we see the critical spirit at work. You see the critical spirit at work in news. You see the critical spirit at work between races You see the critical spirit at work between nations. There's a critical spirit between those who have and those who have not. The enemy is just continuing to stir up a critical spirit, and it's super easy for you, for you to get your hope destroyed by a critical spirit, but it's also super easy for you to become the person with the critical voice. So the next time you want to speak something critical about another person, Please listen to me. The next time you want to speak something critical about another person, I just want you to remember who's moving your lips when you say those words. Satan. He's the one moving your lips. Why? Because he is the one who births the critical spirit. Why? Because he wants to use a critical spirit to to decrease joy in your life. So, man, if people have spoken critical words over you, would you just remember where critical spirited people and critical words come from? They come from hell. I don't, know how to, I don't know how else to say it. I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. Critical words that deplete hope in your life do not come from heaven, and they don't come from this earth. They come from another place. They come from an enemy who's trying to kill hope in your life. So if you've got people who have spoken critical words over you, let me give you, give you some advice. Pray for them. Bless them. Speak life into them. When those words, those critical words echo through your mind, take a moment and pray for them, that God would heal their heart, that God would do something amazing in their life, that God would open up their eyes and he would help them see the uh, the amazing grace and amazing love that Jesus has for them. Amen? Let me tell you another thing that kills hope, unnecessary guilt. Man, too many of us are walking around with the sins of our past and we're carrying around like, like we're still owned by them, like they're chains around our lives. Satan loves to keep your attention on the past. He loves to keep your eyes focused on your past failures. But here's what the Apostle Paul said in in Philippians chapter 3. He said, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I'm forgetting the past. I'm leaving that behind. How can he say words like that? Well, when it comes to, you know, past guilt, here's how he can say that with confidence. Because he goes, I repented. I sought forgiveness. I laid them down. Now, here's what we have to do with guilt. We have to forgive ourselves. It is one thing to bring your sins to God and to ask for repentance. And to come, excuse me, to ask for forgiveness with a repentive heart. It's one thing to come to God that way. It's another thing to actually forgive yourself. Forgiving yourself is hard. Why? Because you can't forget your past failures. So when your past failures, the enemy keeps trying to use those to cripple hope in your life, you got to bring them back to God. And you got to to remember that guilt and condemnation, they don't come from God. They come from hell. John 3, 17, you know, the verse right after the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. John 3, 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Condemnation and guilt, they don't, come from, they don't come from the Lord. They come from hell. Why? Because they, they want to deplete your joy. They want to deplete your hope. So when you allow guilt and condemnation to live in your heart and mind, it's like walking around like carrying last week's trash with you. And not in a plastic bag that makes it smell good. I'm talking about an old paper bag where all of the grit and the grime and the ugliness have soaked through it and it's dripping on you as you carry it. When you let guilt and shame stay in your life, you might as well be carrying last month's trash in a paper bag with you everywhere you go. And you know what that is like? That stinks. You don't want to live like that. You don't want to live like that. 
So bring, bring your past to the Lord. Lay it at his feet and then ask for the power of the Holy Spirit. Trust in his power to help forgive yourself. <laughs> forgive yourself. We are the hardest on ourselves. Forgive yourself and move on. Don't let the enemy use your past failures to deplete your hope. Let me give you one last thing the enemy does. you got to understand the impact of exposure. So whatever you think on, you become. Whatever you read the most, you become. Whatever you dwell on the most, you become. Wherever you live the most, that's where you become. And Satan knows this. Like you get exposed, and it just sickens you, right? It's like living next to nuclear waste. You live next to nuclear waste, you're going to get sick. Just like you, you drink bad water, you, you eat bad food, you're going to get sick. Whatever you expose yourself to the most, if you expose yourself to this thinking about dwelling upon a sinful nature or an anti-God nature, here's what's going to happen. You, you emotionally, mentally, and spiritually are going to become sick whatever you expose yourself to. That's why Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says this. Guard your hearts above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart. Whatever you get exposed to the most is going to affect you. I remember I was down in Mexico leading a, a youth trip one time, and we were playing in the pool in Mexico. And man, that sun was just beating down on my back the whole time. I didn't even know it. I got such a bad sunburn. I was exposed to the sun too long. I got a bad sunburn. Two nights later, I was crying like a baby. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. I mean, I could not sleep. You couldn't lay on your back. You couldn't lay on your stomach because the sheet was on you. I mean, it doesn't matter what was going on. Like, it was painful. Why? Because I was exposed to the sun too long. And I was exposed to it without any kind of protection, and it burnt me. This is exactly what Satan wants to do. He exposes you to sin long enough, it burns your heart. And when it, your heart gets burnt, you lose hope. This is what he's doing. This is what Satan is wanting to do. But God's wanting to do just the opposite. Did you guys realize that Satan's trying to kill hope, but God's trying to increase hope in your life? Let me tell you a few things the way God tries to increase hope in your life. He, he tries to increase hope by helping you understand worship. you got to understand the true power of worship. Worship, guys, I'm not talking about just singing songs. I'm talking about being in the presence of God. Because it's in the presence of God that you find life. It's in the presence of God that you find hope. Hope increases in the presence of God. The psalmist knew this. That's why he said in Psalm 1611, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Listen to what happens to your life. Listen to how hope increases in your life when you're in the presence of God like you are today. Right? It does this. It renews your strength. It reconnects you with God. It rekindles your hope. It rebuilds your confidence. It restores your joy. And it releases your anxiety. Hope increases when you are in the presence of God. That's why you need to be seeking after God's presence more than just on a Sunday. Seeking him and being in his presence on a Sunday only, guys, is not enough to overflow with hope. we got to start trusting him throughout the week. Here's the truth. The enemy of hope can't live in the presence of God. The enemy of hope can't live in the presence of God. It was right before World War I that a man, he attempted to take his plane and he wanted to fly around the world. He knew it was going to take a lot of time. It was an old, old those old school planes, you know, like where the wings are made of metal, they're, they're made of fabric, and inside the cockpit, it's not pretty, but you got all of the controls and you can see all the wires running everywhere. And so he takes off on the East Coast and he, he starts flying his plane like he's going to fly towards a Europe kind of a situation. He's flying east. He takes off. He's going to fly for four hours because that's all the fuel he has. He's up at altitude and he's cruising along and he's thinking like, this is amazing. Like, this is the first leg of many, many, many legs to get around the world with this single engine airplane. And he starts hearing this very weird sound, a sound that he had not heard before. And he's thinking to himself, is like the engine already going out? Well, what's happening here? Like, am I going to survive this? What's, like, what's going on? He's looking at his instruments. He's looking around in the plane. He's looking at the wings. He's making sure all the big parts are on because that's important as a pilot. Make sure those wings are still on. And he's looking around and he can't figure it out. And all of a sudden he looks down and he sees that there's a rat in the cockpit with him. And you know the noise he's hearing? The rat is chewing on the aircraft cables. And he's like, I can't get the rat. And if that rat cuts through that cable, I'll lose my, I'll lose my ailerons. And I won't be able to fly this plane. I'm just going to crash right here. First leg, big vision, fly around the world. Crashes first, 
first flight. Like that's the way the story was going to end. And so he was like, I can't get it, I can't get it. And all of a sudden he gets this brilliant idea. And he goes, if I take the plane and I fly as high as I can fly for just a little bit of time, then that rat will lose oxygen and that rat will die. And that's exactly what he does. And he flies up and he, he's flying along and the rat dies. And after he lands, after a four-hour flight, he gets out and he throws that rat out. Let me tell you this, rats can't live in the presence of God. Here's what that means. Anxiety, fear, worry, hopelessness. It can't live in the presence of God. Rats die in the presence of God. Hopelessness dies in the presence of God. In the presence of God, hope increases. Come on, somebody. That's good news. And it's a great story. Let me tell you another thing. Here, here's another thing God uses in your life to increase hope. He uses the Bible. And you've got to unleash the power of the Bible in your life. In recent studies, we found, as we've surveyed many, many Christians, okay, and I've been reading some of these studies, did you guys realize the number one thing, the number one thing that increases spiritual growth in your life is the Bible? The Bible. So when we, when we insert more of the Bible into our lives, it has the power to change the way we think. God's word can change the way you think. Would you just turn to the person you love most that's sitting next to you or that's near you, and would you just tell them God's word can change the way you think? God's word can change the way you think. John Maxwell, a great, a great teacher on leadership, he said this about this topic. He goes, look, when you change your thinking, you change your beliefs. And when you change your beliefs, you change your expectations. When you change your expectations you change your attitude. And when you change your attitude, you change your behavior. And when you change your behavior, then you can change your life. All great life change starts by changing the way you think. And the Bible has the ability to change the way you think. Therefore, the Bible has the ability to increase hope in your life. You need more hope in your life? Get more of God's word in your life. Here's another thing God says increases hope. Great relationships. So what do we have to do? We have to build great relationships. It's, all, it's proven. It's proven that you will go farther, you will run faster, you will dream bigger, and you will accomplish, accomplish more when you got the right people in your life. You don't have the right people in your life, you don't accomplish great things. But when you got the right people in your life, you accomplish things that are beyond what you ever thought possible. It's also proven that when you are isolated and when you keep away from people, you are unhealthy. Unhealthy mentally, unhealthy emotionally, and unhealthy spiritually, and that means you deplete hope. So when you build great relationships, you have the power to increase hope in your life. So that's why Ecclesiastes 4.9 says it this way. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other, what? Succeed. So hope increases when you have the right people in your life. When you get followers of Jesus Christ in your life, close friends, hope can increase. Let me give you one last thing God instructs us to do if you want to see hope increase in your life. And that's this, you got to listen to the right voices. I've had a lot of bad voices say to me, you're never going to make it. It's impossible. You should just give up. You should walk away. You should quit now. Who do you think you are? I've had a lot of people in my life say words that are the wrong voice. I'm standing here before you today because I've chosen to listen to a couple of voices. The first voice, the voice of the Holy Spirit in my life. The second voice, godly, trusted people in my life. I'm standing before you because I've listened to those two voices. The voice of the Holy Spirit and the people that, tr that I know, that I trust, that are godly people, and I let them speak into my life. The right voices will always deposit more hope in your life. It really acts almost like a bank account. If you got a bank account and you take $100 or $1,000 and you deposit it into that bank account, what happens to that bank account? It grows, right? It doesn't just grow. It increases in worth and it increases in value. And when you let the right voices speak into your life, your life increases in worth it increases in value. When you let the right voices speak into your life, your life increases with hope.
Like last week, Pastor Tyler talked about your life like it was a cell phone battery. I want to give you another analogy about that. I, I like these close proximity chargers where you take your phone and you lay it on this charger. No cords required, people. You lay it on the charger and the cell phone charges. My cell phone, I lay it in my car on a certain spot, it charges. My computer monitor has this nice little disc on it, on the stand. If I lay my cell phone on that, it charges it. I don't have to even, I don't have to even plug a cable in. What happens? All I have to do is get it in close proximity. How do you increase hope in your life? You gotta stay in close proximity to God. You gotta get your life laid upon his life. So as we come into a time of worship, Go into close proximity with God. Go into close proximity with God through his word and increase hope in your life. Go into close proximity with God through prayer and, and let hope increase in your life. Go into close proximity with God through joining with and building healthy relationships with other believers and hope will increase in your life. Do you have an enemy that's trying to kill hope in you? Yeah. But do you have a God who is greater? Yes, you do. Let's lean into the things that God uses in our life to increase hope. And let's flee and walk away from and ask for God's help with the things that try to kill hope in our lives. You can't escape this world, but our all true powerful God can help you increase hope in your life so that in trusting in him, you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Why don't you stand with me and let's pray. Lord, I thank you today that you are a God of hope, <laughs> that you are the God, you are the source of hope. That means hope becomes the power of everything in our life. So Lord, today, would you, would you just convict us where we're allowing the rats to live in our life? And can we, take, can we take our life with all those rats in it, can we take it to your presence and let those things die so that hope can live? You're the source of hope. You want us to overflow with hope. You want us to overflow with hope so that we have all the joy and peace and purpose that life was supposed to be meant to live with when you're at the center of it. You also want us to overflow with hope because we live in a world that is crippled and it's decaying with hopelessness. And you send us into this world as beacons of hope and of life. So Lord, would you cause this church to lean into you let us get in close proximity with you right now. And let's let hope increase radically in our lives. And everybody that wants to see the hope of Jesus Christ increase in your life, finish this prayer with amen. 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 Let's do it. Amen. So there you have it. Four hope killers and four hope fuelers. Don't log off just yet. My name's Robert. I'm your online pastor. And I just want to help you to take a next step. And so that your hope can come alive in your life. So here's what I want to help you do. There you have the four hope killers, four hope fuelers. Which of those stood out to you? And this isn't just a thought exercise. Really, this is something to help you to reflect on what did you sense God speaking to you? Because God will speak to you and he will speak to you so that there can be change and that there can be growth in your life because God wants the best for you. He wants you to be fueled and full of hope. So I'm gonna read through these one more time, the hope killers and hope fuelers. And I just want you to listen, which is it that God is pointing out to you? Is it unhealthy people that you need to cut out of your life? Is it unkind critics that you need to cut out of your life? Is it unnecessary guilt that you need to cut out of your life? Is it underestimating the impact of exposure that's killing hope in your life? Is it, uh, is it understanding the power of worship that you need to start implementing? Is it unleashing the Bible in your life? Is it building great relationships? Maybe it's listening to the right voices. Which of those is it that God is pointing out to you? Let me just real quick give you some practical things that maybe you could do to do this unhealthy people. Maybe there's some people that you just need to stop hanging out with. You need to stop, you need to stop associating with. Maybe there's unkind critics that you need to stop listening to their voices that are dragging you down. Maybe it's unnecessary guilt. You're living in your past and you're not living in the future that God has for you. Maybe those are some of the things. Maybe, maybe with the, the unleashing the power of worship, maybe you just need to spend some time worshiping God this week. 
If you email me, robert at mynewlifechurch.com, I'd love to send you my personal prayer and worship playlist on Spotify that I worship with. I'd love to give that to you. Maybe it's reading the Bible, unleashing the Bible in your life. Maybe you aren't opening the Bible. You aren't reading God's word. There's no guilt. There's no shame. I just want to help you to be able to unleash the impact, the power of God's word in your life. Just go to bible.com. Go to bible.com. You can download a free Bible there. I suggest using the NLT translation because it's just a simple translation to understand and it's accurate to the original writing there. So go to bible.com, get yourself a free Bible and start reading. There's Bible plans that you could even start this week that just help you to get in and read God's word. Maybe it's connection and relationships. Maybe you need to start listening to the right voices. I don't know what it is, but God is speaking to you and I just encourage you take the next step. Reach out to me, Robert at mynewlifechurch.com if you need any help or you wanna talk through this some more. I also want to give you an opportunity today because I know you may have walked in today hopeless, feeling drained. Maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've gone to church before. Maybe your family even grew up going to church. Maybe you have gone to church your whole life, but maybe today you're realizing you don't have a relationship with Jesus. It's just a thing that you do, but it's not a relationship that is actually in your life. You've not made the decision to surrender your life to Jesus, to give up control, allow him to be the leader of your life. Today, you can receive hope, joy. You can be fueled, have a relationship with God. You can be a part of God's family if you'll just take the step to step over the line and say, Jesus, I'm surrendering to you. Have my life, lead me and guide me. And if you're ready to make that decision today, I would love to pray with you. So right now, just raise your hand in the chat. Just raise your hand in the chat. Type, type, type the raised hand emoji or click the button in the chat. Raise your hand. Let us know you're surrendering your life to Jesus. Just as a public display, as a first step. And then now you surrender your life to Jesus through praying a prayer. Just talking with God, surrendering to him. So I invite you, pray this prayer of surrender with me as I pray right now, if you're ready to surrender to Jesus. Repeat after me, Jesus, I recognize my need for you. I'm done living life my way. Choose to live your way. Today, I surrender my life to you. Do you give me hope? Do you forgive me of my sins? Do you make me a part of your family? Would you help me to follow you? Is your plan for my life? Give me hope today and help me to do what it takes to stay fueled moving forward. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, amen, I'm so proud of you who made that decision. I celebrate with you. All of heaven rejoices when one person surrenders their life to Jesus. And now, now, you might be asking, now what? Well, I have a free book for you, Following Jesus. It's your seven next essential next steps in following Jesus. I'd love to send it to you for free. If you'll just let me know that you surrendered your life to Jesus, I'll give you this free book. So you can just text the word free to the number on your screen and I will give you this book. I'll email you a free copy, a digital ebook of following Jesus, your seven next essential next steps so that you can know what does it look like to follow Jesus moving forward now? I'd love to do that. You can click the link in the chat or you can text the word free to the number on your screen and I'll be sure to send you this free copy of following Jesus. So glad that you all are here today. Take the steps to be fueled and full of hope this week and come back next week as we're continuing this hope series and bring someone else with you. Come in person or join online. This message was encouraging to you. Just copy the link wherever you're watching. Send it to a friend, share it on social media. You have power to reach others with the hope of Jesus just by simply sharing the link. So take that next step today as well. Until I get to see you again next week though, may God bless you and strengthen you.